Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good afternoon everyone, I welcome you all for my second session of bone tissue engineering. Um, in our first session we discussed about uh, the function of bone, the uh, brief introduction about what is bone and, func and its function and we uh, studied its anatomy and physiology in detail and also the formation of bone as well. Uh, so today uh, in this session we will be discussing about bone tissue engineering uh, strategies and uh, what are the key components present in uh, tissue engineering uh, application. Uh, so, in the last three decades bone tissue engineering has been a very new concept and a useful concept for uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons as well as the biomedical community in order to overcome the limitations uh, uh, for the enhancement and regeneration of bone defects. So, uh, to start with we should know what is tissue engineering, I think by uh, by this time you, you all would know what is the definition of tissue engineering which is nothing but uh, where it encompasses the knowledge of uh, life sciences and engineering together for the development of a biomaterial in order to replace, restore or regenerate a diseased tissue or organ or in general it has been defined as the application of scientific principles to the design, construction, modification and growth of living tissues. There are three ma major elements present in tissue engineering which com uh, comprises the tissue engineering triad. Uh, the first element is biological scaffold which is biomaterial and the second one is cells and the third one is growth factors. So, scaffold, cells and growth factors all together makes a tissue engineering triad. So, this is just a brief introduction about tissue engineering and tissue engineering triad. So, what is the need for bone tissue engineering? I think we have discussed that in our uh, first session as well. So, to overcome the limitations uh, like uh, which we are uh, facing in current uh, clinical uh, uh, operations like in grafting procedures uh, like autograft uh, where we graft tissues from the same individual um, but due to limited availability, donor site morbidity and uh, the second uh, option is uh, allograft where it has the chances of immune rejection and pathogen uh, transfer. So, in order to overcome all these limitation we need a substitute bone graft substitute to enhance the bone regeneration or to repair the uh, bone defect. So, the field of tissue engineering, bone tissue engineering focuses on the alternative option that will completely eliminate the above said limitations uh, which are facing uh, in the current uh, grafting bone grafting procedures. Uh, as I said like uh, over uh, 2 million uh, procedures, surgical procedures is uh, performed uh, in every year bone grafting procedure where bone is considered to be the second mostly transplanted uh, tissue after blood. So, this diagram explains the uh, classic bone tissue engineering uh, paradigm uh, which highlights the several key players. The key players are the three major components of tissue engineering triad, the cells. The first one is uh, biocompatible scaffold that closely mimics, the scaffolds are nothing but the uh, 3D structure which mimics the extracellular matrix uh, scaffolds and the osteogenic cells to lay down the bone tissue matrix. When I was explaining about the uh, cells types of cells present in the bone, uh, uh, we have uh, four different types of cells where osteoblast cells, osteocytes, osteogenic cells and osteoclast cells. So, osteoblast is for responsible for the formation of bone, osteoclast is responsible for bone resorption and osteogenic cells is the only bone cells that can divide, differentiate into osteoblast cells. So, we need osteoblast cells, os sorry uh, osteogenic cells to lay down the bone tissue matrix, the second uh, essential component. And the third one is the growth factors which is the morphogenic signals that can help to direct the cells uh, to the phenotypical early desired desirable type and also for the growth enhancement of the growth that is the growth factors is the third uh, major component of bio bone tissue engineering. 
so scaffold cells and biological factors all three together to uh, compresses the tissue engineering triad bone tissue engineering triad so in this session we'll be dis, uh, dealing about uh, in detail about the each component key component of bone tissue engineering so bone tissue engineering involve the uses of porous 3d scaffolds the 3d scaffold as i said it take, uh, mimics the extracellular matrix or in general it acts as the template it acts as the structural template for the cell to enter adhere proliferate and differentiate and thereby uh, it enhances the formation of new tissue and it has to degrade so it should be degradable and it is a temporary implant it cannot be assigned to a permanent implant and so it involves the uses of porous 3d scaffolds that along with cells and bioactive uh, factors that can provide support for cells to spread migrate differentiate for new tissue formation sorry uh, three components are biomaterials cells and growth factors so we'll be uh, seeing the strategies for biomaterials cells uh, based strap approaches and growth factor uh, based approaches in the later uh, presentation so to start with biomaterials based approach we should know what is a biomaterial what is a biomaterial biomaterial is a natural or a synthetic substance that has been engineered to construct to perform in a uh, construct in a uh, to perform a biological function with a medical purpose okay it can be either uh, medical purpose can be either therapeutic or a diagnostic one evolution of biomaterials uh, in 1960s or 1970s first 70s first generation biomaterials has been uh, developed so it was developed in an idea just to mimic the tissue which got damaged uh, due to physical reasons or uh, where it has to mimic the physically damaged tissue because of uh, fracture or disease or any other traumas so they are just a bio inert materials and they do not interact with the biology of the host organism so first generation materials are called as bio inert materials for example stainless steel and its alloys comes under bio inert materials and then then they switch the gears from the passive materials to the active materials the second generation materials are called bioactive materials bioactive materials where it can interact with the interact with the host uh, biology host organism biology there uh, where there will be an interaction between the uh, grafts as well as the cellular level interactions between the host organisms and in 2000s third generation of biomaterials has been developed where it is the bio resorbable materials where it helps in the formation of new tissue it combines the properties of bioactive as well as the bio resorbable where it interacts with the uh, cellular level uh, uh, cellular level in the host organism as well as uh, it gives a specific response and also it develops the new tissue formation it helps in the development of new tissue formation and in 2020s where they develop bio mimetic materials where they develop a material which mimic the nature of the na natural material so uh, in this uh, biomaterials based approach will be focused mainly on third, uh, third generation materials for example uh, polymer and its composites so again they are classified into osteo inductive materials hybrid materials advanced hydrogels immunomodulatory materials the first category is osteo inductive material the word osteo induction the word osteo induction which means it instructs the surrounding cells for the formation of bone surrounding stem cells for the formation of bone so those materials should have the ability if i say this is an osteo inductive material that means that material had as the ability to in, induce the bone formation by instructing the surrounding cells in vivo environment to form bone for example hydroxyapatite and calcium phosphate or ceramic based materials are prone to have osteo inductive property the second generation class of biomaterials is hybrid materials they are nothing but the combination of two or more biomaterials with enhanced functionalities in the either in the form of copolymers or polymer polymer blend or 
polymer ceramic composites. Copolymers are nothing but it is a substance where it developed from two or more monomeric species. For example, PLGA where it uh, <coughs> developed from the monomeric units of polylactide and polyglycolide. We can tune the properties of both the monomers where PLA has the glass transition temperature above room temperature and, uh, and it has very long degradation rate whereas P, uh, PGA polyglycolide has glass uh, transition temperature below room temperature and it has shorter degradation rate. So, we can combine and tune the properties of PLA and PGA which are FDA approved polymers and we can develop a polymer which is copolymer hybrid material PLGA with a tune, uh, tailorable, uh, tailored uh, property uh, in the end and polymer polymer blends. So, uh, again the same example I will tell you about PLGA the degradation product of PLGA will be acidic in nature. So, Prolonged exposure of tissue to acidic product will lead to tissue necrosis and eventually the implant will lead to failure of implants. So, what we uh, researchers will do is they combine with the polymer like for example, phosphorzines. Phosphorzines, where the degradation product of phosphorzines are in neutral uh, pH. So, they combine PLGA as well as uh, phosphorzines to develop a biomaterial to give a non toxic degradation products. The uh, final one is polymer ceramic com uh, composites, which are very useful in bone tissue engineering, and th this we can call it as biomimetic scaffolds. It has all the uh, desirable properties for bone tissue engineering. The third class of uh, biomaterial is advanced hydrogels. Hydrogels with because of its uh, physical properties and its structure it has wide it has been widely used in tissue engineering application and the uh, recent research have uh, showed that self assembling peptides have gained uh, recent uh, enormous attention for forming sca uh, scaffolds as they are completely biological bio compatible and biodegradable. For example, rad I 16. It is a self assembling peptide where uh, it aims to na uh, mimic uh, natural extracellular uh, matrix uh, and it can be readily synthesized and it is uh, injected in the form of nanofibers. It is injected in the form of nanofibers once it enters the physiological fluids and it becomes this gel and it serves as a template for the starting material, this template as a starting material. The final one is immunomodulatory biomaterial. So, in order to suppress the immune reaction, we need, we can uh, develop a biomaterial that can modulate or manipulate the immune system in a favorable manner for the enhancement of bone regeneration. So, this all about the biomaterials based approach where I will uh, focus mainly on scaffolds. The scaffolds, uh, scaffolds are the masterpiece of bone tissue engineering. A bone scaffold is the 3D matrix that allows and stimulates the attachment, proliferation of osteoinducible cells on its surfaces. And the first one was developed by Green in early 1970 where they injected, uh, where they seeded cartilage cells into the scaffold. That is how it has developed uh, uh, seeding cells on uh, scaffolds. And uh, the image which shows there is a long bone where there is a defect and we have to place a scaffold in that defect and check for the enhancement or regeneration of the long bone. So, scaffold since the scaffold it is in a masterpiece of uh, the bone tissue engineering we should be more careful in uh, selecting scaffold and its properties the materials and for the everything for the preparation of scaffold. So, the first one the scaffolds can be categorized into four classes polymeric ceramic composite or metallic scaffolds. Polymers again polymeric scaffold can be uh, derived from either natural polymers or synthetic polymers and co uh, composites may be the combination of polymers and ceramics and the scaffolds requirement of the ideal scaffold and any ideal scaffold for bone tissue engineering it should be biocompatible. And 
it should not it should be biodegradable and it should not be a permanent implant it is a temporary implant and it is non toxic and highly interconnected porosity this porosity plays a very important role in bone tissue engineering because the pore size the pore size is very important for the cells to enter and uh, proliferate uh, differentiate and also for the diffusion in and out of the nutrients and wastage uh, the pore diameter or pore size it should be greater than 100 micrometer and it should be mechanically strong since we are uh, aiming for bone tissue engineering the scaffold should be ideally strong and uh, it should uh, mimic the either cortical if in case for a cortical bone tissue engineering it should have the mechanical properties similar to cortical bone whereas the spongy bone the cancellous bone it should mimic the properties of this uh, spongy bone also it should enhance vascularization vascularization is the formation of new blood vessels so any ideal scaffold for bone tissue engineering it should be biocompatible it is it should not be uh, toxic it should bio uh, should be biodegradable it should have highly interconnected uh, porosity it should be mechanically strong and it should enhance vascularization the the three properties of uh, scaffold which uh, clearly shows the ideal scaffold uh, properties the osseo integration which is nothing but the biocompatibility it should get uh, integrate well with the ost tissue and osteoconductivity where it helps in the formation of new bone on the surface of the grafts and osteoinductivity it should direct the cells surrounding cells for the formation of bone so these are the main properties of the ideal scaffold and micro and macro structures are the nothing but the porosity structures mechanical properties it should be mechanically strong so these are the main properties of a scaffold to be used in bio uh, bone tissue engineering so this picture where it shows the treatment of uh, bone defects uh, with the presence of uh, scaffold the first there is a bone defect in the uh, bone gap uh, defect gap in the uh, long bone where we place the scaffold in that uh, defect gap defective gap and this scaffold first it should uh, it should be osseo integrated it should be osseo integrated then it should be osteoconductive osteo inductive and then the healing process this is nothing but the vascularization the formation of new vessels so uh, from this there will be some uh, few uh, graphical images uh, just for teaching purposes should be aware of this uh, graphical uh, images which are taken from the literature uh, for uh, for knowing about the information what they have done uh, for uh, scaffold based uh, strategies so in um, these are called as first generation scaffolds which, which are nothing but the group in uh, national university of singapore collaborated with uh, temasek polytechnic where they optimized the parameters uh, for uh, pcl polycaprolactone and its composites for the development of scaffold by by fdm method fdm method is uh, fusion deposition uh, modeling which is nothing but the 3d uh, method 3d printing method for the development of biomimetic scaffold they considered this as a first generation scaffolds where they did uh, perform clinical trials for uh, clinical uh, uh, studies for 5 years after 5 years they said that the outcome was uh, positive and uh, again the another research group used this kind of uh, burr hole plugs for the treatment of cranioplasty barrel plugs for the treatment of cranioplasty the another group has tested with uh, another uh, uh, clinical trial uh, another uh, set of uh, experiments where they used this uh, pcl uh, barrel uh, plugs and they studied in rats and uh, after uh, after 12 months 12 months th they got an positive outcome and the ct images shows the uh, 
perfect alignment the CT images shows the perfect alignment of PCL sheets to the 3D orbital uh, uh, cavity. The first image where they use this PCL sheets uh, in the uh, uh, autologous iliac crest uh, where they removed a skin from there where they placed this uh, sheet and uh, uh, tested for the regeneration of uh, uh, bone and they, uh, they found it successful uh, and the second where they did for uh, skull defects the second image where they place these PCL uh, barrel sheets on the skull defects uh, and then after uh, 12 months of the study they found that uh, they have uh, perfectly aligned and uh, they heal the bone defect. So they, then they have uh, moved to uh, the second generation of scaffolds where they wanted to study with uh, PCL and composites uh, okay where they have done uh, they prepared scaffold using PCL tet, uh, tricalcium phosphate and collagen and they created a defects uh, uh, around 5 mm diameter uh, uh, in uh, rat parietal bone in rat parietal bone and then they tested for uh, uh, healing of the bone defects and in the C and D you can see the micro CT, uh, CT scanning image where the skull defect after 14 months there is the complete closure of the uh, bone uh, there is the closure of the uh, uh, bone with the presence of the scaffold when it is compared with the blank where there is no scaffold at all and this was done in uh, red parietal uh, uh, bone using uh, PCL uh, sheets uh, uh, with and its composites the scaffolds which they, these are the biomimetic scaffolds and the f this one is the pig spine uh, fusion model and the uh, below uh, pictures are the ra uh, rabbit uh, uh, New Zealand white rabbit skull defects uh, uh, they have tested for cranioplasty again uh, analysis of tissue engineer the concept shows that the formation throughout the entire uh, uh, scaffold and no fibrous tissue formation is seen and micro CT analysis revealed that the 30 percent of uh, PCL TCP resorbed and uh, replaced by bone and this is uh, for the treatment of uh, load bearing osteochondral uh, defects again uh, uh, load bearing uh, since bone we need uh, to test for load bearing uh, defects uh, again with the PCL and uh, calcium uh, phosphate where they have uh, drilled a uh, hole in uh, uh, load bearing osteochondral defect they created load bearing osteochondral defect where they have uh, seeded mesenchymal stem cells along with the uh, scaffold PCL uh, CAP scaffold and then they inserted on the defect and after uh, after 12 months or uh, I am not sure about the uh, month or the time after a certain time there is an uh, closure of these uh, bone defect in the presence of uh, uh, scaffold. So, uh, this is all about the scaffolds. The scaffolds we have seen about its uh, properties of the scaffold required for the uh, ideal bone graph and few examples about uh, biomimetic scaffold uh, where they developed for the first time first uh, uh, engineer first generation scaffold and the second generation scaffolds and now we move on to the strategies for bone uh, regeneration. Uh, cellular based approach first we seen about scaffold based approach and now it is the cellular based approach the cellular based approach uh, we have uh, seen that there are four types of cells osteoblast cells which are responsible for the formation of bone osteocytes which are the primary cells for a matured bone and uh, which are responsible for to maintaining the concentration of uh, uh, matrix uh, uh, mineral concentration of the matrix and osteogenic cells which are responsible for the differentiation and into osteoblast and osteoclast cells which are responsible for the bone resorption and so cellular so though the volume of uh, cells present in the bone is less but its function is crucial uh, so we need to have bone cells in order to repair uh, uh, bone uh, defects there are four uh, base of uh, these are the first uh, uh, proposed approach firstly proposed approaches cellular based approaches implantation of uh, unfractionated fresh bone marrow is the first approach and the second one is the purified culture expansion of mesenchymal stem cells and the third one differentiated osteoblasts and chondrocytes and the fourth one is the cells that have been modified genetically to have uh, recombinant uh, bone morphogenetic protein. So, we will look into first approach. Uh, so, these approaches mainly based on the uh, primitive mechanism uh, primarily targets the 
see uh, cellular based approach in bone tissue engineering primarily targets the early stages of bone repair when the skeletal progenitus becomes impaired so so uh, this can be mainly due to uh, uh, either trauma or any disease conditions or maybe uh, can be due to aging as well uh, these proposed mechanism by which implanted cells uh, enhance bone regeneration uh, in um, bone tissue engineering involve first is early release of key osteogenic and vasculogenic molecules and growth factors and the second one is it forms the template to recruit the osteogenic cells and vasculogenic cells and the third one is actively laying down the bone matrix and vascularizing the bone structure uh, construct these are the uh, steps that follows in the uh, cellular uh, based approaches and the first approach is the unfractionated fresh bone marrow approach in the first picture where the patient the first is they are uh, anesthetized and the second one uh, is the uh, defect and where they remove directly remove the fresh bone marrow and inject the cells into the uh, defective site so they remove the bone marrow so so we we all know cells present in the bone marrow region so they remove the cells from the bone marrow and they inject uh, into the uh, defect sites directly as well as along with the uh, some uh, matrix so they inject bone marrow cells along with the matrix so after few days or a few months we can see from the radiograph images where there is a complete uh, uh, healing of uh, the bone defect uh, we can see the uh, difference in the picture b and c where there is complete healing of bone defect due to the uh, injection of bone marrow cells uh, osteogenic cells directly from iliac crest the posterior wing of iliac crest and we inject into the defect site but the disadvantages of uh, this uh, is uh, availability again uh, it is autologous as well as it increases pain and it, it requires two surgeries where we need to remove and we need to uh, inject into the defect sites so it, um, it requires lot of pain and uh, time consuming and everything and the next approach is differentiated osteoblast and chondrocytes approach we all know the form uh, bone uh, mechanism formation of bone mechanism as i explained in my first section uh, session uh, in formation of bone occurs in two mechanism via intramembranous and endochondral ossification so what people are, researchers have thought like why don't we inject osteoblast cell differentiated osteoblast cells or chondrocytes directly into the defect or along with the mesenchymal stem cells okay so first they have tried they dif uh, inject differentiated osteoblast cells they achieved in that they achieved uh, increase in uh, enhancement of bone regeneration whereas in the second picture this picture where what they have tried is they tried to inject chondrocytes so uh, because they thought that endochondral ossification uh, first the formation of cartilaginous template thereby laying down bone matrix uh, right so what they thought why don't we uh, inject chondrocytes directly into the defect sites so vacanti and uh, vacanti and this group they did this research what they did is like uh, they injected chondrocytes into the bone defect and they compared with with the periosteal uh, cells where what they found is there was a formation of cartilage layer in both the defects they compared with periosteal uh, uh, cells and uh, chondrocyte cells and but after uh, cartilage formation the the defect where they inject only chondrocytes they didn't find any formation of vascularization or angiogenesis nothing it was like that in turn they found that the chondrocytes produces the precursor cells which has the cues which which inhibit the vascularization so uh, the other defect where it, they have found the cartilaginous template as well as the formation of uh, bone and everything it was there and whereas in the defect where they injected only chondrocytes they didn't uh, they couldn't find the vascularization network or neoangiogenesis which is the primary uh, formation of blood vessels so they found that injecting chondrocytes alone will not support in cell based approach then the this approach the mesenchymal stem uh, stem cells approach is uh, effective approach uh, where they can uh, uh, this mesenchymal stem cells 
can undergo a replication without differentiation. It can go and uh, we can passage 30 times of this mesenchymal stem cells uh, and which increases to up to 1 billion fold of cells without differentiation. It has to differentiate only in the presence of implantation. So, this is one of the research where they recently produced uh, where in the seg uh, segmental defect they created a bone defect with uh, they inserted collagen matrix. What happened was the endogenous mesenchymal stem cells slight uh, inverted into the matrix. Then, then this research group with the help of ultrasound they, in, uh, they injected uh, BMP bone morphogenetic uh, protein in order to start the bone repair process with the micro bubbles. So, they suspended in micro bubbles and injected into the mesenchymal stem cell populated scaffold and with the ultrasound what happened this uh, gene entered into the cells with the external stimuli. After few days and this uh, segment after few months this segment got uh, healed completely. So, this they have done it with uh, uh, all the the all the rat uh, animals uh, which are treated with this kind of approach has, has been completely healed with this uh, mesenchymal stem cells approach. So, first there is the uh, creation of segmental defects they implanted the co collagen scaffold place this collagen scaffold the, this is the scaffold and bone marrow. After 2 weeks this mesenchymal stem cell slower it is invading the scaffolds and then they inject uh, DNA and micro bubbles which is uh, which has bone morphogenetic protein and they apply ultrasound the external stimuli. Now all the DNA will get into the cells now it will start bone repairing process. See how beautiful is this approach. So, where they have scaffold cells as growth factors as well all the three combined together and used for the repair and regeneration of that that big bone defect. Uh, in the next session we will be dealing about the uh, growth factor based approach and the commercially available bone graphs and what are the current trends and future direction of bone tissue engineering.